Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And uh, I was looking through some of my notes that I had in my Bible from last year. And what I had spoken on, I, I don't often reflect on those, but it was right here in my notes. We looked at uh, the vanity of religion, the validity of the resurrection, the victory of redemption. And uh, that's a blessing. Amen. Hallelujah. We're going to be in the same chapter uh, as last year. And I'm so thankful that God's word is, is alive, is living. You can spend, uh, it amazes me that some of our brothers and sisters that are in different parts of the country don't have access to the Bible like we do. And so they commit when they get any scripture, they commit to memorizing it as fast as they can. And we're so blessed to have God's word available to us. I, I pray that we cherish it. So blessed. So blessed. If you found your way there, I'm going to probably read uh, the first 26 verses. And uh, as a matter of fact, let me go ahead and do that now. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received and wherewith you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen of Caiaphas, then of the twelve, after that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some have fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of the apostles, and last of all he was seen uh, of me also as one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, that I am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God, which was in me. Therefore, whether it be I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some of you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain and our faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that, he, that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised? And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain, as are yet in your sins, and, and you are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that sleep. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom of God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. Hallelujah. We thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you that, uh, that you are alive. And this is a celebration, Lord. We should celebrate this every day in this way. Lord, we are so ecstatic that you hear our prayers. And Lord, we want to give you glory in all things that we say and do. Lord, let your word penetrate our hearts, wash our minds, and bring great joy to our hearts. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. When it comes to death, most people fear death. I was uh, looking through a few things. I didn't go ahead and put it in my notes, and I'll see if I can pull it up if I have it here still. 
Let me see. Ah. See if this is it. Most people will fear death and they do all that they can to try to stay alive for as long as possible. Going back as far as uh, 1600 BC, um, there was an anti-wrinkle recipe for transforming an old man into a youth. It's recorded on the back of an ancient uh, papyrus. And uh, it's, it calls for water mixed with something called uh, hemayet fruit, which we don't know of that now. And then it was boiled and dried. Seems feasible to try to stay alive as long as possible. In the sixth century BC, those who wanted to live longer are advised to consume a mixture of root powder, gold, honey, and butter after a morning bath. In 133 BC, an alchemist, uh, Li Shou Chun, advised uh, the emperor to eat with utensils made of gold transmuted from cinnabar, a potentially toxic sub substance known today as mercury sulfide. As I, as I look through these things, I see that they also tried using uh, uranium as a, as a youth formula, putting radiated makeup on your face. That didn't, that didn't go too well. There are some other things that, uh, that use particular pieces of human body, even to the consumption of human blood, of youths to try to stay uh, alive and live forever uh, to some degree. Um, I was looking through this list of things and just thought, wow, people really fear death, that they would put some things in their body that are not only hazardous or toxic, but immoral at that. I know that they're still trying this and we know about transhuman, uh, uh, oh, somebody help me with the, with the name. Transhumanism, there we go. And, and people are wanting to live forever. What I'm thankful for is that I will live forever. Hallelujah. We have eternal life in Christ Jesus. We don't have to put some ointment on our face. We don't have to ingest anything. We don't have to put it into our bodies. And we certainly don't need to try to transfer our souls into machines. That's not going to be a thing for Christians, by the way. That's going to be for the ungodly, those that do not want to face judgment. I got to thinking about this particular passage of Scripture, and I thought, uh, I'll go ahead and title this message, What If the Resurrection Never Happened? What if the resurrection never happened? We would probably be gravitating to some of these ideas of trying to stay alive because this is it. This is the vapor that we have, this life. And I think that we would probably pursue after whatever pleasures we could, try to get as much as we could, because we know that we came into this life with nothing and that we'll leave this life with nothing. Right. However, we know the Egyptians thought that maybe they could have an account in the afterlife and were buried with a portion of their riches. And we know that that didn't work either. There's only one way to eternal life, Amen. and his name is Jesus. Amen. Amen. His name is Jesus. But as we look at this scripture, what if the resurrection never happened? When we look at verse 14, Paul is telling us under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and if Christ be not raised, then our preaching is vain. Everything I've been doing with my life for the past decade and a half, what I have uh, uh been a part of and sharing the gospel, this preaching would, wouldn't amount to anything. It would be a, a coping mechanism that we're all trying to get through life. And you're going to listen to a formula that we have put together. But if Christ be not raised, then there is no value in the preaching. Preaching is in vain. Us getting ready and coming to church today and next week or last week, it wouldn't matter. It's all vanity. We're just trying to, to cope with life. That sounds tragic, doesn't it? Because for some, preaching of the gospel and Jesus Christ and his saving grace is vanity to them because their eyes 
are shut. Their ears are closed. Their minds have been blinded by the God of this world. Everything. Here's the most amazing thing because I lean heavily on scripture to, uh, to create, I shouldn't say create, but God has created an identity that I have to identify with. And I'm thankful that the word of God helps me to understand who I am in Christ. In Romans 1.16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. If he is raised, he is alive, and there is power to save through the gospel. Therefore, preaching is vital. Preaching is profitable. It is not vain and profitless. Secondly, if we look at uh, the second half of this, verse 14, and if Christ be not raised, then our preaching is vain and your faith is vain also. Faith would be futile. People put faith in all kinds of things. As a matter of fact, if you ever get back on a plane again because they decide that they're not going to limit people's freedom to travel as they are now, then we will get on that plane never having met the pilot. We might be able to catch his voice on an intercom, but we are going to climb into a massive piece of metal that is going to accelerate at high speeds and it is going to get off of the ground with wind beating against it through the clouds, through storms, navigating. And we put our full faith and trust in that pilot never having met him. People are gonna put their faith in something. People put their faith in themselves. They put their faith in philosophies. They put their faith in false gods. I'm thankful that our faith is not in vain because we serve a risen Savior. Everything in Christianity hinges on this one reality that Christ is raised. Where's Confucius? He's in the ground. Where is Buddha? Dead and buried. Muhammad, the prophet of Allah, dead, buried. They put their faith in dead men. And we put our faith in the risen Lord, creator of all things. One who is sovereign, who is providential, who cares about the details of your life and mine. And ultimately, he's preparing a place for us. Hallelujah. Whoo, glory to God. And he tells us some 365 times in scripture in one way or another, do not worry, do not be afraid, do not be dismayed. He is preparing a place for us. Hallelujah. Faith would be futile if the resurrection had never happened. Got to thinking about this in Hebrews 11, one through three. I'm just gonna look at maybe one and uh, had written it down. Now, faith, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Our faith in Christ is our full trust in Him. Hallelujah. In Him. And if He dwells in us, then our Lord can do many things through us. Not that He's limited in what He can do by us, but he wants to work through us. I'm thankful for that. I put my full faith and confidence in him and I have a heavy conviction that this is true. Now, faith is the substance of things not hoped for. There is a confidence is the substance of things hoped for. And we're talking about those things, a place in heaven. For the evidence the proof of our conviction of the things not seen. Our full faith and confidence is uh, touted that we are to place that in the U.S. dollar. Is your full faith and confidence in the U.S. dollar? 
Putting your full faith and confidence in Jesus Christ is the only thing in this life that has eternal value. I am heavily convicted by the scriptures, by his, his dwelling in my life, by his transformation of my character, by, by everything that he's done for me, the blessings that I see, and even the trials that I go through, I see how he's molded me into the man of God that he designed me to be through all of these things, even when I resisted. He is so faithful. Amen? So faithful. So faithful. And we can put our full faith in him. Hallelujah. Trust him with everything you have. Without the resurrection, faith would be futile. Without the resurrection, as we read through scripture, the disciples themselves were deceivers. In verse 15, he says, Yea, and we are found false witness of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. We are also deceivers if there is no resurrection. For we tout that we speak on behalf of God. This is his word, his infallible, inerrant word that he has given to us and we are called to be witnesses unto him, witnesses and testify, hallelujah, testify of what he's doing in our lives. Is anybody else with me? Amen. Are we here? Hallelujah. I get all excited about this because I'm not a deceiver. The believers were not deceivers. How many hardships have you endured for the sake of Christ? Haven't we all endured something? Now, maybe our brothers and sisters they have endured much more. And we need to be in prayer for our brothers and sisters that are in other countries. We're beginning to see some of the persecution and it's very light tyranny that we're exposed to right now. But it could get greater. I pray that we would have the faith of some of our brothers and sisters in other countries who don't have the liberties and the freedoms that we have, the ones that we take for granted. They might never have had them. But yet they preach Jesus. They teach Jesus. They testify of Jesus working in their lives. When I think of the disciples being deceivers, I think that people will most certainly live for a lie. People lie for two reasons. One, they want to get something or they want to get away from something. They're either lying to you to get something from you or they're lying to be spared from something, i.e. punishment. People will most certainly live for a lie to avoid those things. But knowing that it's a lie, people will not die for a lie. They will not die for a lie. When we think of the apostles, when we think of those early believers, we think of these that have absolutely given their entire lives to the promotion of the fact that Jesus Christ is risen, that they have seen him, they have touched him, they have beheld him, they have walked with him. He lives in them. Hallelujah. And they were told, no more, can't do it. But yet they were willing to die for Christ knowing and trusting the word of God that to live is Christ and to die is gain. We're all going to die. They did not fear death and they were not going to die for a lie, especially in the ways that they did die. Simon Peter was crucified upside down between 64 and 68 AD under Nero's persecution. He was executed upside down. He was crucified upside down per his request that I cannot be crucified in the same manner as my Messiah, as my King. It must be different. Who does that? Unless they believe that Jesus Christ is risen. It's not compartmentalizing anything and go, well, I'm just going to get out of this deal and then I'll have the opportunity to preach tomorrow. No, sir. No, ma'am. Do not crucify me in the same way as my, my Savior. Make it upside down. Andrew was crucified on what's called St. Andrew's cross. It was an X. He was actually tied to it and not nailed, uh, nailed to it. And it took several days for him to die. 
hanging there, dehydrating, without food. And you know what he did for the whole duration until his last breath? He preached Jesus from the cross. Who does that? Unless they know. They know. They know. John the Beloved is the only one that we know that was uh, obviously exiled to an island for a period of time and then he went off to Ephesus and he is the only one of the disciples that we know was not martyred for the sake of Christ. But Bartholomew, a very uh, unmentioned apostle, uh, ministered in Armenia and was flayed to death with knives in India. So he goes off to preach Jesus and ultimately finds himself with his skin being cut off of his body because he will not stop professing that Jesus lives. Jesus is alive. The resurrection is true. And Jesus has paid the penalty for our sins And he is alive, making intercession for us. And if you will confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you too can have eternal life. And because it went against the norms of that society, it was seen as we would term it blasphemy to the point of death. Matthew died a martyr's death in Ethiopia. Thomas, otherwise known as Didymus, was killed with a spear in 70 AD in India as well. James, the son of Alphaeus, crucified in lower uh, Egypt. And then afterwards, his body was sawn into pieces in front of the people as a deterrent from preaching that Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. You've got to believe that, don't you? To go through that and then to see something along those lines. Thaddeus was shot through with arrows in Persia in front of his ministry partner, which was Simon, Simon the Zealot. And he ultimately was crucified as they ministered together in Persia. Incredible. Incredible. There are so many stories of people that are willing to die for the sake of Christ. And for us, brothers and sisters, for us, what are we asked? What are we asked to do? Live for him. Live for him. Nobody's asking you to die. Nobody's threatening to cut you into pieces. Nobody's going to shoot you through with arrows or stab you with a spear or cut off your head. So Jesus says, live for me. Whoo, I don't want to be a deceiver. I want to live for Jesus. Hallelujah. And if it is required, if my life is required, I pray, I pray that I'm not a fool that gets scared in the moment, that I would die for Christ, knowing that it's gain. I've not been asked to do that. I've come close before when I went to Pakistan. And I, 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 I resolved in my heart that as I left, as I went to preach evangelism in an area where it is illegal to evangelize Muslims, I remember putting together my, making sure that my, my life insurance policy was in order, had the agent come to the house and talked with my son and said, if I don't come back, preach at my funeral and preach Jesus saves. Jesus saves. I'm thankful that the Lord did not require my life. And I'm sure that uh, Pastor AJ has many stories along those lines. Not all of us have been called to do that, but we've all been called to live for him. Amen? And we're in the greatest country to live for Jesus. I'm telling you right now, it's the greatest country. It's ugly and it's not looking too good in different areas, but I'm telling you right now, we can still walk out these doors and we can find somebody that's standing across the parking lot crying and we can go and teach Jesus and preach Jesus and pray with them and ask for deliverance in their lives and they can have eternal life. And then we get to walk off and go to a coffee shop or go get a meal. Amen? 
We don't have to run from the police. We don't have to hide in gutters. We don't have to do any of that. Are you not blessed? I'm, I'm just thinking I'm blessed. I'm blessed. You know, in all of this, there was a lot of things that had come up. How many people have ever looked at the possible theories for Jesus' body not being in the tomb? Has anybody looked into that? You have? A little bit, a little bit. They want to come up with all kinds of reasons. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. The best one, is the, the, the best one, well, besides the mass hallucination that all these 500 people, all these people hallucinated that Jesus was there, that, that loses merit very quickly. Um, the fact that the disciples might have actually taken the body so they could perpetuate the deception doesn't hold water either because there was a Roman legion that was attached to this. There was a seal on it. And these, by the way, were disciples that were fearful. As a matter of fact, at the crucifixion, what did they do? They all fled. They all fled and they went into hiding, save John and some of the ladies that were just, if we're going to die, I guess we're going to die here. Everybody else ran off. Certainly they weren't going to take on within the next few days, a group of trained soldiers that were on guard with a mission that if they failed, they could lose their life. Some would believe that the Romans might have taken the body, but this would have only perpetuated this false narrative, if you will, of a risen Messiah that was giving so much charge to the disciples' uh, cause. So they would have just said, oh, here he is, <laughs> and would have ended it all. But there was no body. There's another thought that there was the swoon theory where Christ did uh, not die on the cross, but he fainted for a lack of blood after his beating and after the piercing of his side was taken down from the cross and was placed in the tomb and was not resurrection, re resurrected, but he was just resuscitated in the coolness of the tomb. And so this man who was bleeding profusely uh, has gotten enough strength to unwrap himself from this, this wrapping that he was in, first of all, then in the darkness of the tomb stumbles to a one and a half ton rock that has been placed in front of the door. And with this little bit of strength, musters up enough to roll this massive stone back only to take on 12 trained guards on the other side. After defeating them, he went on his way. That's a theory about what happened to Christ. Now I've tell you on two occasions, I've been to Jerusalem. And on both occasions, I went to the tomb and the Lord wasn't there both times. Hallelujah. <laughs> he wasn't there. He wasn't there then. He isn't there now. He is the risen Lord. Hallelujah. People are trying to get people convinced that, uh, that the resurrection is not so, but I'm telling you right now, I know that it is. Hallelujah. There's many other theories. Those are some of the strongest ones. But here's the thing. The disciples were not deceivers. They were believers. Hallelujah. They were believers, just like you and I. Jesus has done some amazing things in my life, and I'm so thankful. I am so thankful. I, I, I know sometimes I'm, I'm totally undeserving of his grace and his favor and his mercy and his, his, his faithfulness and his patience in my life. He is amazing. Hallelujah. Amazing. Amazing. We serve an amazing Lord. If the resurrection were not so, verse 17, and if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain and you are yet in your sins. If the resurrection never happened, then there is no sovereign Lord. And the only thing that is sovereign in this world is sin. We are locked in our sin. Could you imagine if the world had no savior and this was just open, wanton, rampant sin? The only resistance to sin in this world are Christians, are believers. Sin would have full reign over everything. If uh, the resurrection were not so, America would not exist. Think about that. 
the country that we live in would not exist because it was founded on Judeo-Christian principles by those who wanted religious freedom. And it's still afforded us to it today, codified in the Constitution of the United States of America, that we have the freedom of religion. We are blessed. I pray that we not waste this opportunity, this blessing that we've been given to be born in this country of all countries that we could have been born in or migrated to, hallelujah. We are truly blessed. Sin would be sovereign. No amount of works or man-made processes would free us from the law of sin and death. There would be no hope. There would be no help. There would be no healing for our souls. But because he is raised, there is hope, hallelujah. And he is the helper, hallelujah. And he has sent his helper to dwell in us. The spirit of God is in his children, hallelujah. <laughs> and he has healed our souls. I am whole in Christ Jesus. Now this isn't final. This isn't my final destination, hallelujah. I am so excited that I'm going to spend an eternity with you, brothers and sisters, with you. You're gonna know me forever. I hope you like me. <laughs> I like you and I'm getting to like you more, hallelujah, because I see Christ in you. Sometimes we rise up every once in a while, don't we? We jump out, say something. It's like, oh, I don't like you. Where's Jesus? <laughs> God is so good to us. Amen? Amen. If the resurrection were not so, sin would be sovereign. And sadly, in verse 18, then they which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. Death would have dominion. People would think about death all the time because this life is nothing. And if sin was rampant, all that would exist is this worldly, hedonistic pleasures of life, taking from someone that's not there, stealing, murder, all kinds of things. But death would be the dominating factor of life. It's all that people would think about. It's all that people would do. Death would have dominion. If Christ did not raise from the dead in that mindset of death having the dominion, then nothing matters. Nothing would matter. Nothing at all would matter. But if Christ did raise, then nothing else matters. Nothing else matters except that we serve a risen Lord. Hallelujah. And he has blessed us to have his word in our hands, to wash our minds and to, to guide our conduct and for his principles, not only to be lived out in our lives, but for us to project those into our society. Hallelujah. Whether saved or lost, these principles are gold. But Jesus is the diamond, hallelujah, in all of that. So precious. I pray that he is precious, but if the resurrection did not take place, death would have dominion. I found this illustration and I've, I've recalled it and looked it up. I'm gonna read it just like I, I found it. When a man asked George Mueller the secret of his service, Mueller responded, there was a day when I died, utterly died, died to George Mueller, his opinions, his preferences, his taste, and his will, died to the approval or blame even of my brethren and friends, and since then studied to show myself approved only to God. We are to die to ourselves daily so that we can live for Christ. That's what we're asked to do. Live for him. He is alive, brothers and sisters. He is risen. Doesn't that bring joy to your heart? I mean, I got goosebumps and I'm getting emotional, but I love it. <laughs> Isn't God good to us? So blessed. So blessed. Verse 19, if in this life only, this was... This was the passage of scripture that I focused on initially. 
Verse 19, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we, of, we are of all men most miserable. If it didn't happen and, and truly was, was uh, uh, profitless in what I'm saying and I was a deceiver with fruitless faith, at least futile faith. My goodness, what a tragedy that would be. I thought if the resurrection didn't happen, then our future would be fearful. And this is why folks are trying to find out ways to stay alive, because they fear death. Because surely there has to be someone beyond this that may judge our conduct, may judge the lives that we lived. And they are adamant that God does not exist. I've never seen people build such cases and arguments against someone they don't believe exists. Who does that? Someone who fears the future. And if the resurrection did not happen, people would fear the future. They would fear it. This is why even in this passage of scripture, he says that uh, we eat, drink, and we, we die tomorrow. All that, all that we see going on in the world right now, wouldn't that be dreadful? If this, in this life only, this is all that we had, and, and we didn't know of anything beyond this, then we would really, with everything we have, we'd be clutching at things in the world just for self-preservation. There would be days of dread, depression without deliverance, pain without prescription, shame without a savior, lust without love. Only darkness would fill our minds and eventually a death, a death that we'd all fear because we don't know what's on the other side. I'm here to tell you, brothers and sisters, I know what's on the other side. A risen Savior. Hallelujah. A risen Savior who has saved our souls, has sealed us until the day of redemption, indwells you. There will come a time where we'll stand before the Lord. And I don't know how many words I think of that song. Uh, uh, I can only imagine. I can only imagine. I think it's going to be glorious to stand in front of him. I, I, I know the, the position, the proper position would be a prostrate position laying before him without any energy as we've seen in scripture. But how amazing is it going to be? It's not, why should, it, there's, there's different illustrations. Why should I let you in heaven? And, and, and you can see all that stuff. I don't think for us that's going to happen. I think the Holy Spirit is in us. We're there. Jesus knows exactly who we are. Hallelujah. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Well done, my good and faithful servant. That will almost be an immediate sound. Now here's the thing. We will give an account for the things that we say and the things that we do in this life before the Lord at the Bema Seat of Christ. I want a good report. Hallelujah. There's things in my past before the blood that I'm glad that they're under the blood. And there's some shortcomings and failure in my walk with Christ that I'm thankful that he is a forgiving Lord. Hallelujah. But I don't want to go out and do things that are against him, against his body, against his church. I want to give a good report or at least have a good report, if you will, because we don't fear the future. Because Jesus is risen, the resurrection is our reality. And that's what we celebrate today. The resurrection of our Lord Jesus. It didn't just happen. He's been very active. It happened almost 2,000 years ago. But we still celebrate it as if it's a, a birthday. And for that, I am thankful. And I'm thankful that, uh, that even this day, although it's been convoluted with Easter, People talk about Jesus in this time. 
and in this season. I heard somebody in the store wish somebody a happy Easter. And I was like, I wonder if you know what that means. What does it mean when you say happy Easter? What does it mean to you? Happy rabbits and eggs. (laughs) Or is there something more? Something more. Jesus is alive. Hallelujah. Jesus is alive. And therefore, because Jesus is alive, preaching is profitable, brothers and sisters. Preaching has the greatest profit because you are sowing the gospel into the souls of men and it will flourish and God will save them. Hallelujah. I don't know if he's going to do it for everybody, but I'm going to run the risk in knowing that preaching is profitable. Saving souls, holiness and living, the glorification of God. Preaching has a prophet. And the disciples, as I understand, inspired by the Holy Spirit to write these words, hallelujah, the disciples are dependable. Hallelujah. I pray that we as disciples are dependable, as dependable as they were, because they lived their lives for Christ and death to them was gain and there was never going to be a denying of him. Because they knew in the moment of their death, they were going to enter into his presence. The disciples were dependable. And faith, my friends, is fruitful. The object of our faith is Jesus Christ alone. And I'm telling you right now, if you put your full faith, confidence, and conviction in the Lord Jesus Christ, it will be fruitful. Hallelujah. Sin has been subdued. It is not sovereign. It has been subdued. And now here we are as believers and the penalty of sin has been paid. Hallelujah. The power of sin has been procured. We have subdued it in Christ Jesus and we have have this power over sin. Sin no longer has a reign in your life. Now, it doesn't mean that you're not going to make a choice for it, but you have power over it. Do you remember when you had, uh, before you gave your life to Christ, you thought things were okay, then you got saved, and you think, wow, that's as wrong as it can be. How did, it's kind of, you've kind of felt it maybe, but it doesn't have power over you anymore. You recognize it. It's no longer just running your lives. And there's going to come a time where the presence of sin is going to be eradicated altogether, destroyed, gone, won't exist. It won't be present whatsoever. We will bask in the glory of our Savior who is risen. Amen? Death has been defeated. It has lost its sting. In Christ Jesus, I do not fear death. And most people would say, well, I just don't want to be tortured. I don't think that our brothers and sisters that we read about here in scripture, how they died, that it ever crossed their mind that that was something that they didn't want. They obviously didn't think they didn't desire, but when it came, they were ready to enter into the Lord. Could you imagine being hung up on a cross or an X tied to it for several days? How many of us would complain? How many of us would beg for our lives? How many would just beg for a drink of water there in day three? You know, you're thirsty at that point in time. Just something. You're hoping for some reprieve or some pardon. Well, (laughs) Andrew didn't think that. Andrew just preached Jesus. Anybody that would walk by, he was a spectacle for sure, amen? And he used that opportunity in his dying breaths to make sure that Jesus was known because he's alive. He's risen. And lastly, our future is not fearful. Our future is fantastic. Amen? Our future is fantastic. We get to enjoy some of these blessings in this life, and I'm thankful for that, but I'm telling you right now, it pales in comparison to what we will see when we enter into his glory. I'm telling you, there's not a stronger word that I know than fantastic. Fantastic. That's our destiny. That's our future. Fantastic. Is God not good to us? 
God is so good to us. My last thought as I was sitting with the Lord in preparation, I said, because you live, I will preach tomorrow. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Whatever this world has, I'm good. I'm going to preach Jesus. I'm going to teach Jesus. I'm going to minister in his name. I'll lay hands on folks. I'll pray that they be delivered. I pray that they get saved. That's my lot in this life. Hallelujah. And that's the lot for every believer who trusts that Jesus is alive. Do you believe that Jesus is alive? Amen. Well, you better put a smile on your face and tell yourself you're happy. Hallelujah. God has been so good to us. As we conclude this, I pray that you're encouraged. But at the same time, I want us to observe the Lord's Supper together. And uh, the elements have been prepared. I'm going to ask Lamb and Lester, if you would, brother, to help administer these elements. I just want to share with you that we believe. I would even venture to say that we know that Jesus is alive. We take this in remembrance of him and what he has done for us. Hallelujah. The heavy burden of sin was placed on him for our sakes. His body was broken for us. His blood was shed that our sins would be forgiven, washed away. We sang it earlier. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. As I reflect on some of the things that Paul said, and I had mentioned this last week, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, hallelujah, take, partake with this. With many churches, they have what's called a, a closed communion, meaning if you're not part of that church, that you are not to partake with them. I don't see that in scripture. Then there are others that have an open communion where it's open to anyone and everyone, but this is for believers. So I don't see that either. I believe that we have a close communion because the Holy Spirit resides in us and we serve the same Heavenly Father and we praise Him through Christ Jesus our Lord. Hallelujah. So if you know Him as your Savior, you're welcome. I was just mentioning that uh, in a few chapters prior to what we were looking at, Paul encouraged the church at Corinth to examine themselves before they eat, before they drink. He says, for he that eateth and drinketh unworthy, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. I pray this message has been encouraging and I want you to be whole. I want you to be healed in Jesus' name. I want your life to be abundant. But I also want you to live for him regardless of what this world throws at us regardless of what men might say, what laws might be written, that we will serve, we will live for him. So let us take this time just to examine, are there some things in us now that are holding us back? Are we holding on to something from the past that's keeping us from moving into the future? Whatever that is, whatever that anchor is, I pray that you would ask the Lord to break that. Break my dependency on this thing that's happened in the past. I'll have you know that when you're driving in a car, the windshield is much bigger than the rear view mirror. And the things in that rear view mirror do get smaller and smaller and smaller, and they should. If you're only looking in the rear view mirror, certainly you're parked or you're driving blind towards Christ. 
My desire is that we would stop holding on to the things of the past, that we would stop reflecting on the things that and the people that have harmed us in the past. The Lord allowed those things to happen for a reason. No, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. And we want to be fit for his service. Hallelujah. So looking back to these things. I'm so thankful that I don't read in Genesis how Joseph kept looking back that he wishes that he was with his family or he's wishing that he was still in the pit or he was wishing that he was still on his way to Egypt or he still wishes it was in uh, Potiphar's house or he still wishes that he had some favor in the prison. He never looked back to those things. It never shows that he looked back. And we know that God was using all of that to bring him to a place, a position, a prominent position of power that he might be an instrument used to save souls. And that's for you too. The Lord has designed for all of us to be this instrument of deliverance by preaching and teaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So just reflect for a moment. If there's anything, just ask the Lord, remove this in Jesus name. have a fantastic future. He will close to me. I'll never go hungry. He who believes in me will never be thirsty. You are the bread of life. You are the bread to me will never go hungry he who believes in me will never be thirsty you are the bread of life you are the bread of life hallelujah Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for bearing my sin. Lord, thank you, Lord, that we have been freed from the penalty, from the power, and ultimately from the presence of sin because of what you bore on that cross. We give you glory and thanks and praise. We are so confident that you hear us and that you truly are risen. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your perfect plan. The perfect plan of redemption. All through the sacrifices, we see ultimately what would take place. The Lamb of God slain before the foundation of time would shed his blood and our sins would be washed away. Lord, thank you for this freedom. Thank you from the bondage of our sin. And thank you, Lord, that sin no longer has reign over our lives. We have been forgiven. And there is nothing that can wash away our sins but the blood of our risen Lord, Jesus. Thank you.
In like manner, he took the cup and says, this cup is the new Testament in my blood. This do you as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Hallelujah. Bless your name, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for this assembly and this time where we give you praises for all that you've done. Lord, thank you for your strong, infallible word. Thank you for the guidance of your Holy Spirit to lead us into all truth. Thank you for redemption. Thank you that we have been washed, that we are clean that we are in the process of sanctification. And Lord, that we are becoming more like you day by day. You are our King, the King of glory. We praise you in Jesus' name. And God's people said, amen, amen. amen. Are you encouraged today? Hallelujah, I pray that you are. I know that I am. I'm excited. I know that... Uh, when they had taken the Lord's Supper, it says that they all left out singing a hymn. They were all encouraged, even though that this night of the passion was about to take place, they left rejoicing. And I'm thankful that that night took place, and I'm thankful that the crucifixion took place, and I'm thankful that it didn't end there. That according to scriptures, he was buried in a grave and three days later he rose again. And is he alive forevermore? Hallelujah. We serve a risen Lord, do we not? Hallelujah.